Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. As of today, and I think it is in fact exactly today, it is 10 years exactly since I sat down and in one night composed, translated in a sense, and wrote the Cowboy Havamal by translation of the poem Havamal the uh, wisdom poem attributed to the god Odin in the collection of Old Norse mythical poems called the Porgeta, into an English language that's not uh, the form of English typically written, but rather um, an attempt to represent an American dialect, um, in fact an obsolescent American dialect, as spoken by my grandfather, uh, which continued um, the traits of of the language of, of the Old West. So, the Cowboy Hall of Mall seemed like a very appropriate title to me. What I want to do in this video is commemorate its 10th anniversary, first by reflecting on what I think is the value of the Cowboy Hall of Mall, and indeed Hall of Mall itself, uh, in the first half, and then in the second half talking a little bit more about the genesis of the Cowboy Hall of Mall, and uh, its relation to other projects, real and potential, and uh, especially the fact that it's not intended as as, as a joke, but as a, a fairly serious translation exercise. So I'll take a few minutes first to talk about Havamal, what I think of as its value, and uh, a little bit about the specific value, in as much as there is, of the cowboy Havamal. One of the worst descriptions, I think, that exists of Havamal is as a, quote, Viking code of ethics, off quote, although I often see it described that way. There is not that much, it's very specifically Viking about the ethics of Havamal. Havamal has wisdom that is very, very similar to wisdom as communicated by old wisdom figures all around the world. Specifically, I think it has an incredibly strong resemblance to Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, but you can find some similar tone and even specific messaging and works as diverse as the instructions of Ptahhotep from ancient Egypt, or the instructions of Shurapak from ancient Sumer, or the Analects, or the Tao. Um, the world is full of attempts to pass on the wisdom of the old in poetry or prose, um, orally or in writing, to younger generations uh, that could have use of it, but probably won't appreciate that wisdom themselves until they're also old, maybe too old for it to matter. Um, there are a few things, obviously, in Havamal where you can see that it is the product of a warlike raiding society, I think particularly of, you know, get up early if you want to kill someone or, or take a stuff, but even that is not particularly specifically Viking. And if you look at the messaging in Havamal around being, for example, moderate in terms of drinking alcohol, you'll find that it's quite at odds with some of the typical cultural uh, strictures of uh, Old Norse society where men's ability to drink quite a bit was valued, as we see, for example, in the character of the god Thor in several myths. Now, I also don't mean to diminish Havamal when I describe it this way. Sometimes people seem to take it that way, that I'm saying, oh, you know, there's some, I'm making some you know, really kind of uh, new agey point about how everyone is equally wise everywhere or something like that. And it's not at all what I'm saying. Wisdom is everywhere, but it's not in everyone, right? I think that the conditions of achieving the kind of wisdom that are communicated in Havamal are not associated with some particular ethnicity, some particular culture, but more with being a person of a particular practical bent who has also reached a particular age, right? 
as I said, some very similar messaging in uh, wisdom texts that come from quite different cultures, quite removed cultures from Old Norse culture. So, you know, it's, <laughs> I guess the, the, the less friendly version of what I'm saying is that most people anywhere are fools, but there are wise people anywhere too, right? Um, and Havamal is to me a very impressive exemplum of that wisdom showing through in a place where uh, other literature that reflects its time seems fairly counter to its messaging even, right? As I mentioned, uh, the god Thor represents probably more of a typical Viking uh, uh, ethic than Odin's wisdom does in Havamal. Um, you could see the kind of sober, literally and, and figuratively, language and tone of Havamal being taken as kind of weak, potentially, in, in a Viking culture. Although it's hard to say. Sometimes people are more tolerant of those kinds of attitudes in the old. Havamal is clearly uh, the, the, the work of, a, of, of an old figure. I think that, two, a huge virtue of Havamal, and I've mentioned this before, is that it's not a set of commandments. It's not a set of thou shalt, or thou shalt not. In fact, it's fairly vague in some ways about its wisdom, right? Be moderate in your, in your wisdom. Uh, like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's pretty open-ended. Uh, but I think that exactly that kind of vague, stretchy rule is in some ways the most applicable to the most lives and the most potentially life-saving, right? Too much strictness in these rules can actually have the counter effect. I think about, you know, freaking Boulder, where there's all these red light cams. All the red light cams mean is not that fewer people run red lights, but that people rush to run the red lights faster, right? <laughs> it makes probably more people be in danger uh, by making them take chances, especially when it's slick and icy or something like that. Whereas, um, you know, you would probably have a safer highway culture if you just had a more widespread sense of wisdom about what your tires can and cannot do, <laughs> uh, which is vague, right? And it's going to be different from person to person and vehicle to vehicle and, and from year to year of a person's life and, and uh, vehicle's life. So I think... That's a huge, a huge deal with Havamal is that it is vague enough to apply to kind of anyone's life. And it's also almost pre-ideological or post-ideological in the same way that, you know, three or four generations ago, it seems like political parties were in the U.S. before they became these totalizing, you know, life-defining identities. And in the same way, I think that Havamal is enough about about method and means more than ends, that you could speak as much of, say, an Asatru or heathen Havamalist, if that were a thing, as a Jewish or a Catholic or a Protestant Havamalist, right? Havamal isn't a, a text of devotion to a god. It never speaks of such things. It has nothing to do with the metaphysics of life after death. It is to do only with being wise in life, and that can be superimposed or subimposed under other ideologies and beliefs and commitments. All right, I'm going to give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grim Frost in the usual way. I'll come back and talk a little bit about the specific genesis of the Cowboy Hall of Mall. So specifically, how did the Cowboy Havamal come to be? Um, it was one night, I do think it was January um, 2012. I'm a little bit vague on the exact specific date, but it, it 
very well could have been January 21st, 2012, based on, you know, what level I can dig up about my life then. <laughs> it's, uh, I was working at UCLA. I was specifically teaching classes in Old Norse language, Old Norse mythology, the sagas. Um, I taught a class in the history of the Scandinavian languages there. Um, it was a busy time of my life. And it was an interesting intersection for me between the beginning of the peak of my academic skills, right? I was um, very much a fluent reader of Old Norse. I knew the literature and myth well from, from teaching it and enjoying teaching it. Um, you know, I, I, I know more now, 10 years later, but I had crossed and I had, I had reached a certain plateau where I didn't have, you know, another mountain range of skills to climb, but rather was at, you know, I don't know how to put this like black belt level. Not that's a particularly good analogy. Anyway, the beginning of the peak of academic skills and had not yet begun to decline in the peak of enthusiasm. Um, you know, I still had fun with this stuff. I was having a lot of fun in 2010. Well, 2000, yeah, I guess it was basically 2010 when I worked on the, uh, the, the, the rewrite of Star Wars as an Icelandic saga that I did. A much more jokey project than the Cowboy Hoffman, but reflective of a similar enthusiasm for the stuff, right? I could still have fun with it. It wasn't, it wasn't work yet. And part of what burned out a lot of that enthusiasm was the the coming years of teaching classes that were bigger and bigger to people who cared you know not at all for what i was teaching is having no way of communicating interest or enthusiasm in the subject that kind of inevitably dulled some of my own enthusiasm anyway um so high skills high enthusiasm came together and i read on a norwegian blog a uh, neat write-up or sort of translation of Havamal called Havamal for Dummies, in which each stanza of Havamal was reduced to one or two words, right? Like, be quiet. <laughs> um, right, hold shift, uh, keep your mouth shut. In Norwegian, four stanza about not, not talking too much. Well, um, as I recall, the author of that stated somewhere that uh, probably someone who wasn't a Scandinavian couldn't have a personal enough relationship with Havamal to produce a similar um, translation or version of it. And I thought, well, I don't feel like that's true because I have been reading Havamal in one way or another since I had first encountered some stances of it as translated in Edith Hamilton's book, Mythology in about 1997, so about 15 years before this. So that's a long time to have a relationship with the text. Um, when I did first read it in 1997, I thought, wow, this sounds a lot like my, my grandfather. And as I began to read it in the original starting in 2003, I never stopped hearing my grandfather's voice in reading it. The wisdom just sounded so much like the kinds of things he would say to me. And even the tone seemed very similar to the way that he would say it. So I thought, well, this is not true, that not being a Scandinavian, I don't have a relationship to this text. Um, and I, I do have something to do um, that is similar to this. So in one night, uh, and I will frankly admit, uh, a, a night of, of drinking, as I recall, I bought a bottle of um, Tennessee honey, the honey Jack Daniels at, at the time. I had also not yet developed a drinking problem as I later did, but uh, but I, I certainly drank. Um, drinking whiskey, I sat down and I translated these first 80 or so stances of Havamal, the part traditionally called Gestathalter, the, the main thing people think of when they think about Havamal, the, uh, the practical wisdom stances. And I translated them into an English that was as much as I could recall, as he had died almost three years before at that point, what my grandfather sounded like. 
and I haven't really changed it since. Um, it was published as an appendix first to my translation of the Poetic Edda in 2015, and then as a, an appendix to my book, The Wanderers Hall of Mall, in 2019. Um, each time, I think I've changed a couple ways that I spelled words when I was trying to suggest a particular pronunciation of them, uh, just to try to make it clear what I meant or, or, or not have people be confused about what word was intended there, largely on the advice of my uh, my, my editors at, at Hackett Publishing, uh, Brian and Liz. But otherwise, it has remained intact. Um, it is the most intact translation I ever did, as looking back at anything else that I did around that time, or even my translation of the Poetic Edda, I can always find something that I, I would have changed or would have done better. But the Cowboy Hall of Mall seems to me to belong to one act of genesis in a sense. It is much more like a creative project to me than like a translation project and, and as much as I relate to it as something that can't be you know refined or improved. Now that's strange perhaps. I'm not a creative person, right? I'm not a writer or, or, or a poet. I'm not a painter or a sculptor or anything like that. I'm you know I, 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 I'm just a translator but somehow something um, came together that night that let me do this. And, you know, sometimes people have said to me in the intervening years, well, that, that they think that it's kind of funny. And to me, that's not at all the intention of the Cowboy Hall of Mall. It's not a joke. There are stanzas in it that are meant to be a little bit funny in the way that they're phrased, because I would expect my grandfather to be a little bit funny about it, or because there's something funny in the original that's shining through there. I like the thing about how even, you know, cows know when to stop eating. Um, but the, and if that's what people mean by funny, that's fine. But the, the intent of it, right, is it's not, it's not like Weird Al's Amish Paradise, right? Raised a barn on Monday, so I'll raise another, right? It's, it's not trying to be funny by taking one culture's artistic product and juxtaposing it you know, putting it in the mouth of or through a completely different culture and, and, and trying to get laughs that way. It's more about how this type of wisdom can be found anywhere in people from different cultures. And I'm not making a particular argument for, you know, Western U.S. culture being that similar to Old Norse culture. Sometimes people, I think, have taken it that way. And I really don't mean it that way either. It's more that old, practical, hard-headed people in any culture might express exactly the same wisdom. And that's exactly what I was thinking when I heard my grandfather's voice while I read in Old Norse, a language he never knew, the words of the god, Odin, the one-eyed, or the hide one, the high one. And of course, that's what Alphamal means, the words of the high one or, or the one-eyed. Now, uh, I have been happy that people have responded well to the Cowboy Hall of Mall here and there. Of course, not everyone responds well to it, but it's fine. Not everyone's going to respond well to everything. Um, I doubt that I will ever do anything else in my life that will seem as sad to me to know won't survive me, <laughs> right? If if I could think of something to leave to generations to come, I would want to leave the Cowboy Hall of Mall to them. Not because I think there's going to be a lot of <laughs> cowboys in the coming generations or something like that, but just as a, a testament to exactly the kind of hard-won wisdom that I think every generation misses out on to greater or lesser degrees. And... Uh, and the way that that can transcend language and culture boundaries in surprising ways. Um, I know that, you know, eventually it'll be forgotten about, I'll be forgotten about, but it is the thing that I would put into a time capsule and send to the future of what I've done, and I, I doubt anything else will ever reach um, that status for me, which is a big, a big deal to me. Um, I, I, it, is, it is in some ways the most me thing that I've ever done, and the thing that I'm most personally invested in. 
Well, that's a little bit about the Cowboy Hall of Mall, probably more than anyone wanted to hear, but it is 10 years old, I think today, 10 years old, and uh, I'm glad that it has had a decade of uh, being out there for people to read and muse on and maybe reflect on around a fire and remember the wise people who uh, help shape their own lives. For now, in beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best.